Erev Tov Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of our broadcast this evening. And as the title clearly state, states, Prime Minister Netanyahu identified in prophecy. And this was one, I don't know why I haven't seen it before, but uh, clearly uh, something that was laying there the entire time. And as I was examining the story of King David, I uh, clearly seen Prime Minister Netanyahu laying right there in prophecy. Not just Prime Minister Netanyahu, but many, many other issues there that we're going to be looking at. Of course, I've spoken time and time again over the past there that Yeshua was a type of David. And we're going to be touching on that in this broadcast this evening. But uh, I actually have an old article up from 2012, uh, uh, Haaretz here. You can see uh, uh, Christians United for Israel. John Hagee on the stage with Prime Minister Netanyahu speaking to a rather large audience there. And then, of course, the title of the paper or the article here, Waiting for the Messiah. Netanyahu addresses evangelical Christians gathering in Jerusalem. Now, that's pretty bold there, but let me just kind of read to you a little bit about what the article says. American evangelical pastor John Hagee, who, lead, who, excuse me, who heads the largest pro-Israel lobby group in the United States have jokingly compared Benjamin Netanyahu to the Messiah on Sunday night as he waited for the delayed prime minister to arrive at Jerusalem Hotel address the crowd. There's a saying in Judaism about the Messiah, I know that even if he tarries, he'll come. Hagee told hundreds of members of the Christian United for Israel, I know that the prime minister will come even if he tarries, he'll come. Now, as they say, they say that jokingly, but what they what he does say that's not jokingly, as he goes on, says the crowd laughed and so did Hagee, but Hagee introduced Netanyahu when he finally arrived half an hour later. Uh, the comparison with the Messiah no longer seems so far-fetched. He was a fighter in an elite unit and helped to free hostages on the uh, Sabina and fought in the Yom Kippur War. Hagee began as finance minister. He brought Israel from welfare to work, applause. He strengthened the private sector, cut down the public sector. He's married to Sarah, and his son Jonathan is national Bible champion. They, they applauded that as well. He gets up every morning at 6 to study the Bible with his son. Wild applause went forth. He also changed the path of Christianity in America when he asked me in 2006 if he thought American Christians could unite for Israel. Hey, he continued, ancient Israel had Moses who led them in the desert. During the golden era, they had King David who conquered Jerusalem. And today, when there are extra existential threats, Israel has a champion who can confront the challenge. Please welcome the Prime Minister. More wild applauses, whistles, and the sound of a shofar from somewhere. Netanyahu immediately corrected two of Hagee's eras. His son, the Bible champion's name is Avner, that reads the Bible on Shabbat after lunch. He then uh, uh, swayed in the story of the sin of King David when he sent Uriah Hittite off to war so he could have his wife, Bathsheba. The allegory of the poor man and his lamb delivered as a reprimand to David is cited by Netanyahu's example of how all people are equal before the law, including Israel's Arab population. So at any rate, the whole point being in the article here, of course, is Netanyahu, and maybe not of his own doing, but clearly has been lifted up to a very high elevated status. And it wasn't that I went looking for this article. This article just seemed to complement about what I'm about to show you. And before I get into this, let me just state couple of things here real quick. One, some of these things, these types and shadows that are laying clearly in the Bible and the Word of God and who, who clearly can be identified as that character for this day, it doesn't always carry a negative connotation. So although some of these things are going to be pretty critical when it comes to the Prime Minister and his role that he's playing, keep in mind there is still a love that Yeshua has for the people of Israel 
and for their eyes to come open to recognize truly that he is the anointed king, that he is the king that God had called. I noticed that John Hagee totally overlooked that of the Yeshua, that Yeshua had came. Instead, only looked at Moses and King David and then skipped right over to the prime minister. That was a shame. It was a shame on John Hagee that he did that. But nonetheless, let's examine the word of God in light of today, the things that are happening today, and we will see not only Prime Minister Netanyahu, but we will see Rome involved in Scripture. We will see uh, Mike Evans involved in Scripture as far as in types and shadows of the things that have happened in this day. And we should examine our own selves in light of the prophecies that were given back then because clearly, although the stories are written, they are written for our edification and clearly a foreshadowing of future events. Let's get into this right now. I want to open up today with 2 Samuel chapter 15 just for opening in verse 13 and there came a messenger to david saying the hearts of the men of israel are after absalom isn't that interesting and for my jewish brethren that speak hebrew veyobo hamagid el david lemor haya lev ish yisrael achre av shalom Absalom. You know, Absalom's name means my father is peace or the father of peace, whichever way you want to break that down. His own name clearly identified David as the anointed king. But Absalom, even though he was a son of David, he was not the prophesied son of David that would come later down in time. And therefore, Absalom would eventually lift himself up to try to take the place of his father. Why? Because he would be blind to the fact that his father was the anointed king. Just as Israel is the type of Absalom 2,000 years ago, blind to the fact that Yeshua was indeed the son of David, and instead tried to lift themselves up in place of the Messiah himself. I'm going to get into that in just a moment, but let's kind of start from right there. I want to share with you a little bit, though, about the prime minister. It was Mike Evans that anointed Benjamin Netanyahu, according to the story that he tells, to be the, the anointed him with oil and supposedly prophesied over him, saying that he would be prime minister over Israel not once but twice. This was after a meeting he had with Menachem Begin. And of course, when he had the meeting with Menachem Begin, Menachem Begin asked him, what does he come to do? He didn't know, according to the testimony that Mike Evans gives. He later says that he was, uh, that, that God had revealed to him to be a bridge builder between the Christians and that of the Jews. Mike Evans also supposedly a believing Jew, a, a Jewish man that was believing in the Messiah, Yeshua, to be the Messiah. Well, oddly enough, after anointing uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in a story that supposedly is uh, a supernatural event, and he claims that Netanyahu's father in Hebrew called him a moron, not knowing that he knew Hebrew, uh, that chain of events seemed to set the course for Netanyahu to become elected prime minister not once, once but twice. I've always kind of uh, suspected a little bit, though, because the fact that Mike Evans and Pope Francis, the Vatican, and of course, Shimon Perez were also very close. And as I have revealed many times in the past, the Vatican was working on a deal to assert and to be able to make sure that they got their own foothold inside of Israel. Only more recently to discover that the Chabad organization and the Jews of Israel have been working even on a deeper level for global dominance, but also in need of the Vatican to bring about that global dominance. Why? They need the Christian evangelical groups on board. So why not present to them their Messiah, their King David? And that's exactly what we see that has happened. Let's take a look at the biblical account, though. I want to back up just a little bit. We're going to start over here in 2 Samuel. 
Uh, and we're going to deal with, I believe we're actually in chapter 2. Let me just real quick make sure that's where I'm at. Yeah, chapter 2. Right? So, at any rate there, we find out that the men of Judah came and they there anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh Gilead where they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Gabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, and that you have shown this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. That was after him and Jonathan, they were hung on the walls there of Beit Shean, up in northern Israel there, just south of Tiberias. Been there, I actually did a video right from Beit Shean and the very walls, some of the remnants of the walls still standing to this day. And of course, we know that David loved Jonathan, Saul's son. And he always considered Saul the anointed of the Lord. And he was not very well pleased when they brought the message of his death. Even though Saul was a backslidden king, he still considered him the anointed of the Lord. And so now he says, The Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I, I also will requite you this kindness because you have done this thing. Okay? So he goes on. He says, He um, says, now, th therefore, let your hands be strong and be ye valiant. For Saul, your Lord, is dead. And the house of Judah have, an anoint have anointed me king over them. Now, Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, had taken Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim. And he made him king over Gilead, and over the Isherites, and over the Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all of Israel. That was the house of Israel. Right? Now, it looks like Abner was doing kind of a awkward thing, but you're going to find out later that Abner, who happened to be the captain of the host of the army for, for Saul, was an honorable man. And we'll, we'll then get into a little bit of uh, David's captain as well. In just a moment, talk about him in just a moment here. But anyway, we continue on. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanim to Gibeon. And Joab, which was David's captain, the son of Zariah and the servants of David went out and they met together by the pool of Gibeon and sat down, the one on one side of the pool, the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men, I pray thee, arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Now Abner did not mean anything ill by it, but just kind of like do a little sparring together. Well, when they rose up and passed over by number, twelve for Benjamin, and for Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one of his fellow by the head, and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so that they fell down together, wherefore that place was called Hilkalath Hazrim, which is in Gibeon. And the battle was very sore that day. And Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel, before the servants of David, and three of the sons of Zariah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Ashael. And Ashael was light over the foot as one of the rows that are in the field. Now what happens is um, Abner, they begin to flee from the battle because they didn't intend it to be a battle, but it ended up that way. And it was jo uh, Joab's brother, Ashael, who actually chased after Abner. And Abner, as he's going along, he doesn't want to hurt this boy. He doesn't want to kill him. He wants to let him go. And he tells him, he says, you know, don't, don't pursue me. Stop. He says, you know, I don't want to be the one that has to face Joab because I've killed you. But he wouldn't stop. And he ends up taking his spear and throwing it into him. And, of course, Ashael dies as a result of this. But the fault was on. It was actually on Joab for what he did. Now, the odd thing is, is that David recognized this as well. 
he knew that it was wrong in what Joab did. Now, so if we jump down to verse 28, it says, So Joab blew the horn, and all the people stood still and persuaded after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. Because what happened, Joab, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people to return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God liveth, if thou hast not spoken, surely then only after the morning the people had gone away, every one from following his brother. So Joab blew the horn, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more. But it was Joab that was guilty of this. Now, Joab really represents a lot of sinister people out there. Joab represents Rome. Joab represents uh, every false believer there is. But you're going to see how this plays out in the end. Anyway, so it says, And Abner and his men went all that night through, the, through Arabah, and they passed over the Jordan, and went through all Bithron, and came to uh, Mahana Mahanaim. Right? And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, they lacked of David's servants 19 men in Ashael. But the servants David had smitten in Benjamin, even Abner's men, 303 score men, died. And they took up Ashael and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night. Uh, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. Now, it doesn't, the war between uh, the, the house of David and the house of Saul, which is basically when the kingdoms began to start, uh, uh, they were teetering on dividing at that time. Uh, and of course, that'll actually happen after the death of Solomon, but there was already the beginning of that breakup at that time. As we see in chapter 3, we go on through this, and now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David waxed stronger and stronger, but the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And to David were sons born in Hebron, and the firstborn was Abnon, and he goes into the different births, etc., like that. Now, what gets interesting is that as the time goes on, there comes a point where Avner uh, Abner is going to be kind of belittled by one of Saul's, uh, uh, so right here, it's actually starting in verse 6, And it came to pass while there was a war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner showed himself strong in the house of Saul. you got to remember, uh, Abner is only the captain, was the captain of Saul. He's not one of his sons. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Ripah and the daughter of uh, Ayah, and Ishbosheth, said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? One of Saul's sons there now accuses him of having an adulterous affair with his father's concubine. But of course, it, it, it actually didn't ever happen. Then Abner was very wroth for the words of uh, Ishbosheth, and he said, Am I a dog's head that belongeth to Judah? This day I show kindness to the house of Saul, thy father, to his brethren, to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, and yet thou chargest me this day with a fault concerning this woman. God do so to Abner, and more also, if the Lord hath sworn to David, I do not even so to him. So, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. Now, what happened is Avner, he takes, and as a result of this, he sends messengers to David straightway saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee, and to bring over all Israel unto thee. And so Abner was actually trying to do a good thing to unite Israel, the house of Israel, and the house of Judah, which was David was king over the house of Judah, even though they had not officially separated at that time. And he was trying to bring about a good thing. Now that Abner kind of reminds me of the early believers. You remember when Yeshua said to those early apostles, he said, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
And up until 325 AD, until Nicaea, Rome, those early converts that were believing in Yeshua were working on uniting the house of Israel that at that time was split from the house of Judah and were trying to unite them based on Yeshua being the son of David and that heir to the throne. And of course, uh, it doesn't go well, as we're going to find out here in just a moment, because there's a, there's a very evil man that's right in the middle that will stop it and hinder it from happening. And he said, well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, and that is, this is David saying this now, he says, and he says, I will make a league with you, but one thing I require of you, and that is that thou shalt see, you shall not see my face, except thou first bring uh, Mikau, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. Well, Abner honors it. He goes and gets David's wife, even though Saul had given her to another man, and the, and the other guy is crying and weeping and moaning and being like a big baby because he's going to restore him back his wife. Wow. I mean, that's, a, that's amazing in itself. You see? Christ come to get his bride. His bride, Israel, had been given over to Satan. But he comes to take her back. I mean, the types and shadows are just unbelievable in here. But anyway, and Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, and even from uh, Patiel, the son of Laish, and her husband went with her, weeping as he went, and followed her to Baharim, then said Abner unto him, Go return. And he returned. And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, In times past you sought for David to be king over you. Oh, it's beautiful. Now then do it. For the Lord hath spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of their enemies. You see, I mean, David was a perfect type of the Mashiach. And the Mashiach... That's exactly what he'd come to do. Now, let me say something to my Jewish brothers. You may get that mixed up because you say that the Mashiach was to bring about peace and destroy the enemies of Israel, and you say that Yeshua never did it. Yeshua took and opened up Isaiah 61. He read verse 1, half of verse 2, closes the book, said, This day this scripture is fulfilled. He knew that that final deliverance of Israel from the hands of her enemy was to be at his second advent. Not the first advent. And this is where we miss it at. Right? So here we are. And this is another beautiful thing. Here's another, this is prophecy in itself. Abner was also a type of that time frame when Yeshua would come that trying to restore the kingdom back together again. But he's cut short by a devil. And that's Joab. Joab is just like a devil is what he was. And Abner also spoke in the ears of Benjamin. And Abner went also to speak to the ears of David and Hebron and all, all that seemed good to Israel and, and to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David to Hebron and 20 men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were there with him a feast. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all of Israel unto my Lord the king. I mean, that's the type of the communion table. Then they may make a covenant with thee, and, with, and thou mayest reign over all that thy soul desires. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from far, far, uh, Faray, and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. And when Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king and hath sent him away, and he's gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it thou hast sent him away? He is quite gone. Thou knowest, Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest, which was a total lie. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from Borsirah. But David didn't know anything about it. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the midst of the gate to speak with him quietly. It was like a snake in the grass. 
and smote him there in the groin that he died for the blood of Asahil, his brother. You know, Abner never wanted to kill his brother, but they, they, Joab from the very beginning was nothing but a deceiver and a murderer. Abner would have never killed his brother if it hadn't have been that they were killing their people and trying to get away with it. After when David heard, of, heard it, he said, I, am my, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house, and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth by the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Ebshai, his brother, slew Abner because he had killed their brother Ashael and Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and wail before Abner. And, da and King David followed the, the, the bear, the buyer, and they, and they buried him. And Abner and Hebron and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner and said, Should Abner die as a, as a hurl dieth? Thy hands were not bound, neither nor thy feet put in fetters, as a man falleth before the children of iniquity. So didst thou fall, and all the people wept again over him. And the people came to cause David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else, till the sun be go down. You see, Abner was a good man, but it's Joab that you will see as the wicked man. He, Joab is a type of that deceiving part of, of Israel that just does not believe. And also he's a type of the one that will actually help anoint Netanyahu, or in this case, Absalom, to be king over Israel. And I don't lay this to Mike Evans' charge. It's a plot of the enemy. It was a plot of Rome from the very beginning. It was a plot also amongst the Chabad community to be able to unite both Chabad and Esau together again. And who knows? You're dealing with Nephilim race that they're trying to bring back together. No wonder why the Pope of Rome said he would baptize aliens. Think about it. At any rate, a lot of things transpired during this time. And of course, one of the big things is, is Tamar, Absalom, which is David's son, he has a sister called Tamar. Tamar ends up being raped by her brother Amnon. This is something that happens later down the road. And so a lot of evil comes into the house of David. And as a result of this, Absalom waits and he bids the time to be able to kill his brother, uh, for for defiling his sister. And in a way, we would have to say that Absalom was just in his cause, although taking his brother's life was not the right thing to do. But still, he felt like he was justifying himself to for his sister's uh, betrayal and what his brother did to her. But David, though, as a result in his anger over what Absalom does to his other son, has to go into exile, and he does. And he's there in Syria for three years. Now at the time when it comes time to bring him back, it says here in the 14th chapter of 2 Samuel, Now Joab the son of Zariah perceived that the king's heart was towards Absalom, and Joab sent to Tekoa, and fetched thence a wise woman, and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner, and put on mourning apparel, I pray thee. And anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. And go into the king and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. Now, I want you to really pay, pay very close attention to this. Because what we're reading about now, what Joab is doing, because you've got to remember, Joab was nothing but a, a terrible man from the very beginning. Why David kept him as a captain, I have no idea. But nonetheless, he is conspiring to bring back Absalom. 
which Absalom is not just a type of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. He's also a type of Israel. He's a type of the Jews 2,000 years ago that would reject Yeshua as being the Messiah. And he's also a type of the children of Israel that would return in modern days. If you think about it, from the time of David, David was on the earth back about 900 years before the time of Yeshua. Since that time, it was 2,000 years. For three years, Absalom was down inside of uh, the land of Syria. Kind of an interesting type. Three, three years and 3,000 years later, uh, the children of Israel began to return back to their homeland, mainly the house of Judah, which, of course, Absalom is a part of the house of Judah. But it was interesting, though, how Joab goes about it. Joab does it in a very deceiving way. He has this woman come in there, nothing against the woman. In fact, she's, she tells later that she does it out of fear for her own life. But by deception, Absalom is brought back to, the, to, 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 to Israel by deception. Now, it's very fascinating when you look at this, because as we go on, and the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Oh, help, O king. And the king said to her, What aileth thee? And she answered, Oh, of a truth, I am a widow, my husband being dead. And thy handmaid had two sons, and thy two sons strove together in the field, and there was none to part them, but the one smote the other and killed him. You know, it's kind of funny. She's kind of like a type of the, of the church today. Type of the Vatican. Even the Bible says, the Vatican says, she says, I sit as a widow, and I, I well, well, no, oh gosh, how is it? I sit as a widow, and I forget the actual, how the scripture goes there. But even this one here claiming to be a widow, right? Well, she's sitting there trying to deceive David about this, about her sons, right? But then, and as we go down, though, the king realizes what she's up to. Verse 9 says, And the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, My lord, O king, the iniquity be on me on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. And the king said, Whoever saith aught unto thee, bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember, Lord thy God, that the avenger of blood destroy not any more, lest, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of thy son fall on the, on the earth. Then the woman said, Let thy handmaid, I pray thee, speak a word unto my lord the king. And he said, Say on. And the woman said, Wherefore? Then hast thou devised such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking of this word, the king is one that is guilty, and that the king doth not fetch home again his banished one. For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, but let him devise means, that he that is banished be not an outcast from him. Now therefore, seeing that I am come to speak this word unto my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And thy handmaid said, I will now speak unto the king, and it may be that the king will perform the request of his servant. For the king will hear to deliver his servant out of the hand of the man that would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God. So this lady of Tekoa was put up to this by Joab. And she actually confesses this in the very end. Even though she's telling the King David that he's guilty. See, Joab put her up to it. Why? Because he wasn't man enough to do it himself. But the point is, it's a prophecy. It shows that Israel would become a nation by deception. Now, the interesting thing is, though, is David will kiss his son. He will bring him back. The kiss is only showing that God will accept it. Even though it was done by deception, he will accept it. But if you'll notice, you're going to find out in a few minutes, David still doesn't see the face of his son for two years. 
Watch what happens. Then thy handmaid said, Let I pray thee, the word of my Lord, the king be for, for, for my comfort. For as an angel of God, so is my Lord the king to discern good and bad. And the Lord thy God be with thee. Then the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, aught that I shall, as I shall ask thee. And the woman said, Let my Lord king now speak. And the king said, Is the hand of Joab with thee in all of this? And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord king, none can turn of the right hand or the left from aught that my lord the king hath spoken. For thy servant Joab, he bade me, and he put all these words in my mouth and thy hand, of thy handmaid. To change the face of the matter hath thy servant Joab done this thing, and my lord is wise, according to the wisdom of the angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have granted this request. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom back. And so he does. Like I said. Now, when he does, when he returns, and of course, Joab prostrates himself before the king, Right? He feels like that he's in the favor of Ab, uh, the King David once again. right? And Joab arose, he went to Gesher, which was, is in Syria, and he brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him turn to his own house, but let him not see my face. So Absalom turned to his own house and saw not the king's face. Now, I granted, in this type here, Israel is only been in their homeland now for 70 years. But as far as for two years, Absalom doesn't see the face of David, that is clearly a type of Israel, the house of Judah being blind to who Yeshua really was, right? Now, so anyway, we continue on and we go past all the, the other things about Absalom. Uh, and... Let's see, then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come. This is where it gets interesting. This is where you really see, see uh, Netanyahu. Watch this one here. Absalom sent to Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And he sent again the second time, but he would not come. Now he sent him for Joab because Joab is the captain. He needs, he needs Joab to intercede with King David. Right? Second time he does it. Therefore he said unto his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he hath the barley there. Go set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom and to his house, and said unto him, Wherefore have you of thy servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered, Joab, behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king to say, Wherefore am I come from Gesher? It would be better to me if, there, if uh, therefore... Uh, be there still. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Alright? Now, you would not believe how much this types Netanyahu himself personally. And even the Israel. Even though Absalom was brought back by deception, just as the state of Israel was brought into power by the Rothschilds, by Adolf Hitler, even through the transfer agreement, helping the elite Jews that were willing to allow my own people to go to the death camps because they didn't want a bunch of religious Jews in the, in the state of Israel. That's true. Right? So they, they, all these things were being set up this way. But ev, ev, regardless, we still become a nation here in modern days. And many good people came there as well. And Absalom, truly, what he had done in avenging his sister uh, against his brother, you can't really hold that against him. Now, also, Absalom types Israel 2,000 years ago. All right, we're going to go to that in just a moment. But watch this with, with David, though, or with uh, the case of Benjamin Netanyahu. Watch what he does, though, with Joab. He sends to Joab. Joab, he's the one that helped get him there. But he can't get his attention. So what, do, what does uh, uh, Absalom do? He takes Joab's fields and sets them all on fire. Let me show you something. Interesting video. Think about it. Okay. This is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meeting with uh, uh, 
It's actually uh, Schneerson, Rabbi Schneerson, who is believed by the uh, Chabad Lubavitch group to be the Messiah. Now, although he never claimed himself to be the Messiah, they still believed that he was, right? This was in 1990. Watch what the rabbi says to him. Much success. I haven't seen you in a long time. Blessing and success. And a double portion of benediction. I came to ask you blessing and help in everything, he says. In all areas, both personal and political. Since we last met, many things have progressed, the rabbi says. Many things have progressed, says Netanyahu. What hasn't changed, however, is that Mashiach still hasn't come. You see, that's interesting. The whole Chabad group, not everybody, of course, like myself, I never believed it, but the Chabad group believes that uh, Rabbi uh, 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 Schneerson here is the Mashiach, which is ludicrous. Even he didn't believe in it. Right? Watch what he says. So do something to hasten his coming. We're doing, we're doing, he says. Apparently it's not enough. Since many hours have already passed today and he's still and he's still not here. Be there, it's still a few hours left in the day, so try still for today. Well, what did Netanyahu have in mind then? Well, if you want to hasten the Messiah, go burn all the fields of Joab then. Remember, Joab, he's that one to help bring him back. The Vatican played a major role in bringing back also Israel into the Promised Land. They were a major role in helping to establish the state of Israel. They smuggled the elite Jews, like the like like uh, Ben Gurion, Moshe Sharif, and many of the elite Jews that were could care less about the religious Jews of Hungary that were all being sent to their deaths. They were working with Pope Pius XII, and he was bringing them into Israel. All, the ones that I consider to be the criminals, the ones that, that didn't care, that wouldn't give $3 a Jew to get the Jews out of Hungary, and instead sent them to Auschwitz to be killed there. How, how many of you, I mean, there's a lot of believers that listen to this broadcast. How many of you would have given three bucks a Jew? Man, I'd have bought as many as I could. But you know, the Jewish Congress wouldn't allow it. Oh, but they did pay. What was it? Uh, I think it was, they paid like $1.7 They paid $1,700 a head to get the elite Jews out. So yeah, the Vatican, working with the Jewish Congress, it as well as with the Zionist movement, smuggled only the elite Jews and the young people that were capable into the state of Israel. That's exactly right. And in this case here, you know, Netanyahu is a type of Absalom. So Joab, he reaches out to Joab, which would represent the Catholic Church. Look, I'm ready to get a meeting. I need a meeting with the king, with the Messiah. Let's make this happen. Well, you don't listen, I'll burn your fields down. So Iraq, Syria, all the Christians in those countries, not just the Christians, the Muslims. Let's burn them down. Is that the way we get the attention of the Messiah? Maybe that's the idea. Deception's how it all got started. Now, again, like I said, and don't misunderstand me, David kissed Absalom on his head. He accepted it. He accepted, even though it's done by the Rothschilds, still in the sight of God, them coming to their homeland is accepted. But he doesn't accept the idea of burning down the fields. Because when you burn the barley fields, that's a type of burning the children of God. See? Because even Yeshua typed us as that wheat, as the barley. You see? And of course, that barley also represents the bread of life, the body of Christ, which again are the Christians all being burned up. Or the children of God being burned up. So I find it fascinating. Now, as the time goes on, you know, we find out. Let me get back to where we were at now. So he burns down the fields and everything in order to get the attention of his father David. Now, 
David, so jo Joab comes to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. That was after burning down all the fields. Right? But then what, what does Absalom do at that point? He gets, he gets the favor of David. And in kind of in a way here, David now is a type of the believers. He gets favor. And then what does he do? Just like the, just like the children of Israel back in the days of Yeshua, he didn't recognize that his father was truly the anointed king. And instead, even though his name means Av Shalom, my father is peace, he takes and usurps, usurps the, the, the very position of his father. And this is when we get into the scriptures there where Absalom, going in the 15th chapter, and it came to pass after this, Absalom prepared him a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise up early and stand beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man had a suit which should come to the king for judgment, and Absalom called unto him and said, Oh, what city are, there, are you from? Art thou, excuse me. And he said, Thy servant is of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man to depute, depute it for the king to hear thee. That sounds so much like today. Israel is working on becoming a global leader. And they're trying to put the Sanhedrin in power. They're trying to bring about a new world order. The Vatican working with them. The evangelical groups are working with them. And instead, what are you doing? You're taking, just like it was in 2012, the very title of the article. Waiting for the Messiah. That thing Yahweh addresses evangelical Christians gathering in Jerusalem. And he's a type of Absalom. Now don't get me wrong. David loved Absalom even after he was killed. It grieved David that they killed him. And that Joab actually did it. Right? Alright? And this is the other thing. Because why? Israel is going to be attacked and many will die as a result and God will weep over this just as David weeps over Absalom but the point is is Absalom not recognizing the position of his father usurps that authority it says Absalom said moreover oh that I were made a judge in the land that every man who hath any suit or any cause might come unto me and I would do him justice right now in the state of Israel they're trying to bring about to do away with the United Nations and put the Sanhedrin as the new judgment seat of the world Netanyahu is working for this and it was so that when any man came nigh to prostrate himself before him he put forth his hand and took hold of him and kissed him and on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel not just the house of Judah, of all 12 tribes. And this is what's happened today. You know, I'm not against Prime Minister Netanyahu. But the thing is, is you have to understand, even though he's a son of David, he's not recognized that Yeshua is truly the divine Messiah, the anointed son of David. And in this case, he has usurped the authority of Yeshua and all the Christian world is flocking to Israel and to, the, to Netanyahu as if he's some kind of God. Some kind of man that will judge the entire world and the millennial reign will come and the Messiah is going to come and say, Netanyahu is the man of the hour. Is this what you're looking for? And I don't even know who's going to be their Messiah when they fake it up and bring it around. But instead, you're so caught up in all of this. It's a shame. You know, and then David, everything that David does, David does exactly just like Yeshua did. We get, we get over here to, uh, where are we at now? We are in chapter, I believe it's 18, yes. And Absalom chanced to meet the servants of David, and Absalom was riding upon his mule. And the mule oh, I'm sorry, this, was, this is later down. But anyway, before I get to this part here, what does David do? 
Instead of trying to overthrow his son, David takes and he, he humbles himself. He knows that he could overthrow Absalom if he wanted to. But rather than having the bloodshed, he crosses over the, the River Jordan. Excuse me, the Kidron Valley, not the River Jordan. He does cross the River Jordan too. But he crosses the Kidron, uh, the Kidron Valley, goes up like Yeshua, and he weeps over Jerusalem. And says, how long, uh, you know, like Yeshua said, how long I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood. He's weeping, and he says, when he's leaving, he leaves ten of his concubines behind, and he says, care for my house in my absence. That's like the ten virgins of, uh, of Revelation. Right? I mean, the story is amazing. I've taught on this in depth on the other part. That's why I'm kind of skimming over this part here. But but David, he goes over there. Saul's, Saul's uh, what, is, what is it? Uh, Shemai. Saul, one of Saul's sons, is David's leaving. Comes out cursing David, spitting on him and everything. Now, the interesting thing is, is Zadok and Abithar tried to follow David out. But David told them, he says, go back and stay there. They're like a type of the two witnesses. In fact, you're going to find out in a minute, after the death of Absalom, David calls upon Zadok and Abithar to get the people in one mind and one heart and one accord to call for the coming of David's return, which is the return of the Mashiach. My Jewish brothers, don't you realize if David had to leave as a defeated king, and he returned in victory, how much more would the Mashiach, the son of David, have to come on the scene and depart as seemingly a defeated king, but he wasn't defeated, he only did so to save life. David did the same. He departed to save life because he knew if he did a fight, it would kill all of them. And David had the gallant man. He knew he could defeat Absalom, but it was his son. He loved him. Even though he was in the wrong, he still loved him. Same thing with Netanyahu. Even though Netanyahu is in the wrong today and by deception is leading the nation and will cause the nation to be destroyed practically, he's still loved of God. Just blind to who his father is. And he will no doubt will not live to recognize who his father was. I pray it's not that case, but what happens when we get to the 18th chapter? Absalom is determined to kill David. Just like they're determined to kill the believers of Yeshua. And Absalom is pursuing David, trying to find him, trying to hunt him down, trying to kill him. But it backfires on him. When Absalom's trying to flee, when David's men come in there, and of course Joab is among them, Absalom's hair that he had, that old long hair that he had, got hung, got, got him caught up in one of the trees there. And he was dangling out of the tree. And when Joab goes in there, we read right here, and a certain man saw it. He told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in a, in, in a terebinth. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest it, and why, why dost thou not smite him? There to the ground, and I would have had to give thee ten pieces of silver and a girdle. That sounds like when Yeshua got sold out, doesn't it? And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee, and Abshai and Ittai, saying, Beware thou not touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, if I had dealt falsely against mine own life, there is no matter hid from the king. Then thou thyself would have stood aloof. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom. And he was set alive in the midst of the terebinth. You know, that's a type. Joab is a type of when Rome, that's just reminding you, there would be a son of David, too, that would end up having three nails put into him, right? Like I said, the, the types and shadows go back and forth, back and forth, different ways. And ten young men that bore Joab's armor, composed about and smote Absalom and slew him. 
And Joab blew the horn, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, for Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into the great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones, and all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Now David finds out, though, that his son is dead, and he's not very happy about it. In fact, when they bring, bring him word, then said, I'm as the son of Zadok, let me now run and, and bear the king's tidings, how the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear, uh, be the bearer of tidings of this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. Now, as we go on, what we find that happens here is that when they do take word to David, and David finds out that his son was killed, that Absalom was killed, David weeps and mourns for days. For days he's weeping and mourning over the death of his son. And as, that, as, as the message is brought to him, all right, and then what happens though? What's interesting is that David, as he's mourning over the death of his son, Joab comes in to him. Let me just find it here. I've made myself some notes here. Let me see if I can find where I put that note at there. Um, I know it's somewhere here in the 18th chapter. Let me see if I can roll down to it and find it. And he turned aside and said, And behold, Cushite came. Cushite said, Tidings from my lord the king. The lord hath avenged thee this day of all that, that rose up against thee. And the king said unto him, uh, unto the Cushite, It is well with the young man Absalom. And the Cushite answered, The enemies of my lord the king, all that rise up against thee to thee, uh, uh, hurt be as that young man is. All right, and then we go on to chapter 19. And the king was much moved and went to the chamber over the gate and wept. And he went thus and he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Now, again, in this case here, that type doubles back to the children of Israel that put Yeshua on the cross years ago. What David could not do, Yeshua could do. Whereas the children of the, uh, of the house of Judah did not recognize Yeshua to be the Messiah and instead allowed him to be put to death. And David weeping that he would have died in his son's place. He couldn't do it, but Yeshua could. And he came and he did die in the place for the sins of the house of Judah. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom, and the, victory, and the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that the king grieveth for his son, and the people got them by, this, uh, by stealth that day in the city, as people that are ashamed steal away when they flee in the battle. And the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, My son Absalom, O oh Absalom, my son, my son. You know, and for the longest time, I never could understand why David did that until I realized that David was a type of Yeshua, right? Now, Joab comes and he, he gets after the king and he says, you need to go out before the people. They did all this for you, right? He says, and they, they would have all died if it hadn't have been that we did this to Absalom. And that thou, he says here, and thou lovest them that hate thee. That's interesting here. He says, and that thou lovest them that hate thee, and hatest them that love thee. For thou hast declared this day that the princes and servants are not unto thee. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived, and we all had died this day when it had pleased thee well. Now therefore arise and go forth and speak to the heart of thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry a man with thee this night that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that hath befallen thee from, the, from thy youth until now. All right. Now, interesting. He and there's another place, and I forget where it was, but he actually says to David, "You love your enemies more than you do yourself." I think that was over Abner. You know, that was the greatest tribute he could have paid David. Because what did Yeshua say? Matthew chapter five, verse forty-four. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That was a great compliment. He just had no idea what he was doing, right? So anyway, in the 19th chapter, as all this happens, and he's mourning. So David goes out finally. 
And the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told him to the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king. Now Israel had fled every man to his tent. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us out of the hand of our enemies, and saved us out of the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. And Absalom, whom he anointed over us, is dead in battle. Who, excuse, me, excuse me, whom we anointed over us. Notice that. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. But yet they realized that David was the one that delivered them from everything else. They said, Now therefore, why speak you not a word of bringing the king back? Who's doing this? Zadok and Abithar, the two witnesses. And King David sent to Zadok and Abithar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah. Remember what Moses and Aaron did? They went to the elders first. Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? For the speech of all Israel has come to the king to bring him to his house. You are my brethren, you are my bone of my flesh. Wherefore then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, Art thou not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me more and also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. Joab finally got replaced. And of course, as we can clearly see, David is finally recognized by all 12 tribes of Israel. And they remembered what he had done. You know, let me say this in closing. Pray. They're blind and don't know it. Netanyahu is no different. He's blind and doesn't know it. The church amongst the house of Israel the support Absalom, which is under the house of Judah, representing by Netanyahu, for, for just as an example, he's not our Messiah. Friends, you cannot look to the state of Israel and think that this is God's doing. God has permitted it. God has kissed him. But they have not seen the face of God. They have not been allowed to see the face of Yeshua until Zadok and Abithar, a type of Moses and Elijah, can get them in one mind and one accord. And that's not just the house of Judah. That's all 12 tribes. Then the king will return. But before that, isn't it interesting that Absalom sets Joab's fields on fire? Listen, you want to support something that's true and real? Stand with us here. I apologize for it being a chopped up message. I've been studying this all day long after the Lord revealed it to me, but there was so much that needed to be brought out. And I apologize for the length of the message. I know it's long. I apologize in the background noise. I hear the children come into the house and they were all in there cutting up. So uh, forgive me, forgive them. They didn't know, I'm sure what we're doing in here. But uh, anyway, blessings to you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting this ministry. Um, and listen, also those of you that have written us by mail or email, uh, emails are always behind. But as far as uh, those of you that are helping to try to keep this ministry going, we've been very busy and trying to get ready for the conference coming up. We also are looking to try to do some kind of little mini conference there in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, depending on, because we got a little late, we got a one day layover, so we're going to see if the hotel's got a little room where we could hold a little meeting there. As soon as I find out something, I'll post that on our website. But uh, if you would like to support this work, please do. Uh, we can't do it without you. And uh, we do need your help, especially this time of year. So we encourage you to help give IsraeliNewsLive.org our website, and of course, our mailing address here at the bottom of your screen. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live.